All right, so that's me right there. Everybody can, can see, and see, maybe you can move this a little bit more. Um, so I'll start the talk a little bit more about my research and what it is that I do, how I do it. Um, if something gets confusing and, you know, and I've tried to make it so that you don't need um, a neuroscience background at all, but it's hard because that's a lot of what I will talk about. <laughs> Um, but hopefully you will find it interesting and move on and try to see what's all that about the brain and, and you know, maybe pique your interest. So um, the outline that I have for you today is the first thing I'm going to, you know, basically I'm a pain researcher. That's overall how I would call myself, okay? I've been doing pain research now at different levels of basically the ladder from data collecting, Darlene, from this program is in my lab right now. I started kind of like her in a lab doing pain research and I've gone all the way now where I'm the PI and I have my own lab. So I'm gonna tell you how do I study pain or how do I research pain? Again, research and study uh, synonymous. I will also tell you, oh, you can't really, okay. What is pain? Because everything we have to define. So, and I call it pain 101. Um, and then I'll tell you how do I specifically study it, okay? Um, so first, sorry, it's why I study it, what is it, how do I study it, and then I'll tell you a little bit about me that hopefully can inform and help you and give you hope for the future, um, your future. So why do I study pain? Basically, chronic pain is a public health problem. We're talking about millions of dollars in the U.S. alone, but this is actually throughout the world one out of five individuals experience chronic pain. And really, you're looking at a major cause of missed work. Oh, it only works on black, okay, I get that. Um, it's a major cause of missed work. And we know that it's actually very complex and it's unique to every individual. And I think that probably, even though you guys are young, a lot of you may have experienced pain at one point. Was it chronic pain? Well, chronic pain usually is defined a pain that doesn't, that extends the period of healing of a particular, um, if you have an injury, uh, or that over time we cannot find an underlying pathophysiological, um, basically, perpetrator that's causing the chronic pain to remain. So, in addition, though, it's not just chronic pain. Chronic pain comes with basically depression, comes with decreased quality of life. Um, it, it makes it more difficult for people to move and exercise. Um, it gives you trouble sleeping. And over time, we know that it actually uh, impacts your brain negatively. It changes the way your brain works. And in, in 2011, the Institute on Medicine made a report for the first time where chronic pain was actually shown to be not just a symptom, but actually a disease itself. And Americans, over 75, 76 million Americans, reported having chronic pain over the past 24, uh, um, lasting over the past 24 hours. So if you think about, that's a huge number. And 36 million Americans miss work because of chronic pain annually. So in general, the most common types of chronic pain, really back pain, um, uh, in the younger, in your cases, you'll have a lot of headaches, migraines, those are very common, neck pain, facial pain, but there's actually a lot of different, if you have, you know, a nerve in your body anywhere, you could have pain. And five million to eight million people have been estimated to rely on opioids to treat for a long term which is what we're talking about in chronic pain, to relieve pain. Have you guys heard about opioids in the news? Does that ring a bell? Any, in what context have you heard it? Addiction, Addiction yes. Anybody else? Abuse. Abuse, okay. So basically, the reason why we have this huge problem, which Basically, there's been an increase, significant increase in overdose deaths since actually 1999. This one is showing from 2000 right here. But
but you see any opioid, there's a significant increase in the deaths. And the problem is that opioids are one of the few things that um, have been successful somewhat at treating pain. Generally, we know for short term, like when you go into the hospital for a procedure, that it does really well. Unfortunately, over time, addiction, and actually we know that in the long term, based on research, that opioid decreases is analgesic abilities are decreased, meaning pain relieving properties decrease over time, which then increases the likelihood of people taking more to get more pain relief, or depending on your biochemistry and who you are, it may just be because of addictive properties, we don't know. But unfortunately, the reason we have this is because we actually don't have a lot of very good pain relieving uh, medications or treatments. If you think about, so I have the major five public health issues in the US and actually the world, cancer, HIV, heart disease, diabetes and Alzheimer's. The blue bars are the prevalence of those individual uh, conditions. This is the prevalence in red of chronic pain. Combined, it actually, there's a lot more people that suffer from chronic pain than all those conditions combined. In addition, if you look at the costs, which are the, um, uh, the black bar, then they're also significantly more. So basically, chronic pain is costly to society, um, it's costly to individuals, and basically, it's more prevalent than our major chronic diseases. However, up to this report in 2011, chronic pain was just seen as a symptom. You went to the doctor and you tried to be like, there's something underlyingly wrong, this is why you have pain, but pain itself, mm -mm, no. So I'm gonna tell you why basically we have research and research in my lab where we actually supporting the idea that chronic pain indeed is a diseased state. So, um, and, and by the way, the why do I study or research pain is also why do I have a job, right? Because it's so prevalent, a lot of people have it, we don't know how to treat it, there's my job, okay? Just saying. So what is pain? Pain 101 is what I like to call it. I, I teach it like this to pretty much everywhere. Um, but you know, we have to always have a definition because everybody wants a definition. And the International Association for the Study of Pain, IASP, is basically an international organization where you have clinicians, researchers, advocacy, and it's really to advance the research, treatment, advoca advocacy, and education in relation to pain. And the ISP defines pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. Now, by definition, does chronic pain need or require, and this is not chronic pain, but this is just pain, so it could be acute or chronic. I was telling you chronic is generally pain that has extended the healing time, usually we think 12 weeks. Acute is anything less than that, okay? And we think acute will resolve itself. Chronic is much harder to resolve itself, okay? But as you can see, we don't necessarily need damage to have the experience of pain, and I will tell you why. So, Neuroscience 101. Does this, so we have, you guys have heard of nerves, right? Okay, good. So we have our nervous system, okay, and, and again, like I, um, Dr. Beatrice had said, my PhD was all about the nervous system. Um, and basically, we s you have the brain, you have your spinal cord, and those collectively, we call it CNS, a central nervous system. And then we have our nerves. 
which go all the way to the ends basically everywhere, okay? And that's the peripheral nervous system. And I just put that there, put a pin on it, and you'll see why, hopefully. <laughs> so I'm gonna explain to you pain. So here's the nervous system, think of all the nerves. First of all, you need a painful or tissue damaging stimuli that is gonna activate this very specialized cells get here that are called nociceptors, or you can just call them pain receptors, okay? And this pain receptors, the, the beauty of it is that the nervous system has a variety of them to be able to encode and tell our brain specifically what kind of painful stimuli has basically is, is being felt. So we have ones that encode heat, we have ones that encode, encode cold, we have uh, tactile, so punctate, uh, pressure, um, even chemical. So chemical changes will be felt by this specific receptors. And then this in turn, when they're activated, oh, and also the muscles. So muscles, when you have, when you, know, you exercise and you work out, all the chemicals released in within the muscle, they act, they're activating nociceptors or pain receptors, okay? So basically then, depending on the stimulus that you felt, they go into the spinal cord and merge in the spinal cord, okay? And at this level, we have a number of different medications, basically, that will be acting here, what we call peripherally, in the peripheral nervous system. And they can block this pain signal, either at the level of the actual nociceptor, or even at the, ne the level of the peripheral fiber. Or when I say fiber, it's the nerve fiber, okay? Then, the pain signals enter what we call the dorsal horn, so it's actually just the top part of the spinal cord up here, and then basically they can be either decreased or increased. So this cells there, nerve cells, right, they synapse or get to another nerve cell, and it's either gonna make a decision depending on really chemical um, uh, electrical properties of what the input is coming in, where it's gonna say, okay, am I gonna send a signal up further or am I just gonna ignore it? Um, and so at that point is when the first level of what we call modulation. So when I say modulation, I mean things can be modulated or changed, turned up or turned down. And that's one place where it can be, this can be done. So, but from there, if it's, really noxious or painful, it will go up to the next step. And uh, we also have a number of different um, opioids and, and tricyclic antidepressants and anticonvulsants, so different medications that target those specific places in the spinal cord. Um, but then the signal goes up into the brain and that's where you know, we think thoughts and feelings and beliefs start coming into play, but it's really, it's all the brain, because that's how you perceive your world, okay? So if you think about, you know, the perception or like, oh, this is so awful, or oh, this is so great, it's all chemicals in your brain and connections that are being either made stronger or that have weakened or a combination of weak and, and uh, stronger connections. Um, and then basically we also have in the brain areas that will turn the pain down. And from the top, we'll be like, okay, don't pay attention to the pain. So I'm gonna tell you, and again, there's also medications and things that will act centrally uh, in the brain. This is normally when I, talk, when I teach my uh, students at UF, this is what I, what I show them. Um, so pain is a multidimensional experience, okay? You have really a number of components that talk to each other, and that's what gives your very individualized pain experience, which is why it's hard to treat, because your pain experience is not yours, and it's not mine. 
and it will never be. So how do you treat that? So, okay, no. so basically you have sensory, what we call nociceptive, I told you nociceptors, right, are the peripheral nerve endings, and oh, I went too far, but basically detecting. So we have specialized detection, and it actually goes to very specific areas in the brain. Um, then we have motor areas, and when I say motor, is basically for movement, right? And why would you want to move? Because if you grab something that's really hot and it's burning you, what do you do with it? You gotta put it back, you gotta let it go. Well, you, got, you need to send impulses, right? So you gotta move away, you gotta escape. Cognitive evaluative, right? We gotta evaluate, is this a good thing or is this a bad thing, okay? And then we gotta give an emotional affective component to it because if it was a bad thing, you don't want to do it again, which means we got to attach some negative feeling to it. So whenever you see a nail, you're like, that heck, that hurts a lot. I'm not, let me go this way, okay? So why would we have this? So you guys know, um, you know, think about men in Africa, I don't know, long time ago, and you know, you're hunting and gathering and doing your thing, right, going around, and you went to get water or a water hole, and you break your leg because, I don't know, right? So it hurts because you broke a leg. And then there's a hippo charging at you. You know, in Africa, hippos kill a lot of people, right? More than other stuff combined, I forgot <laughs> exactly, but. They're, they're pretty vicious. Um, so you, have, you see the hippo in the water and it's charging at you. What do you think is that leg going to tell you? Is that leg gonna bother you at that moment? What do you need to do? So we gotta modulate because we gotta survive, right? We, we, you know, does the leg being, I don't care. I get it, because if I'm on, once I'm alive, I'll deal with it, right? Now, why is that? Okay, so here's my, don't, don't worry about all the names. These are all the things that we study, all the areas in the brain. But basically, the reason why pain signals tap into all those th things I was telling you, emotional, cognition, evaluative, motor, it's because it actually just goes everywhere in the brain. Not everywhere, but many, many places in the brain. Related to thinking, executive function, right? Um, appraising, emotions, motor, movement. Because in order to do that, it needs to tap into these areas. Similarly, what goes up, go, comes down. We also have to, like I was telling you, descending modulatory pathways where basically we can get either pain facilitation or pain amplification, okay, or pain inhibition. If you need to run from the hippo, you need to have pain inhibition, and your body knows that. However, when you get a sunburn, you went to Miami and you went out on the boat and you got burned, it hurts. You touch it, you literally brush your clothes on it. It hurts like heck. That's pain amplification because you need to let it heal. That's the way your body's telling you, let it heal, don't touch me. The same with the injuries. The injuries, you have all this peripheral stuff going because you need to amplify and let it rest. However, the pain experiences in the brain. Because of that, these descending pathways can block that signal from the leg that's broken so you can run from the hippo. Make sense? And the same with like childbirth, for example. Childbirth, you know, you, it's very painful. But during the painful stuff, you can think about it and breathe and, you know, one of the 
natural pain relieving properties to have a child is for you to breathe and you know the lower you and you lower your anxiety how do you do that is by telling yourself this beautiful thing is coming you know now if you think you have cancer that pain is much different oh my god this is the cognitive part your your really your thinking and how you reframe your thoughts about your body and how you feel so <clears throat> what is pain? Pain 101. Basically, it's complex, multidimensional. You need it for survival. If pain is good, children that are born without the ability to feel pain, they have congenital um, uh, analgesia, basically they, they can't feel painful stimuli, they die very young. If you don't feel pain, you will die. So it's good to feel pain. Now, that's acute pain. Chronic pain, whole different world. It involves many brain regions and we're able to modulate it. So pain is in the brain, even though pain, the brain itself has no pain receptors. But if we don't have the brain, we won't have that experience. In animals, when I studied pain in animals, um, there are some assays that basically are like, you know, if I, if I, um, do an animal and I give them a poke, they just move. So that's more a reflex, right? That's, so we call that nociception, activation of the nociceptor. But in order to be pain, we need to do basically activation up here. And there are assays in animals where we actually can make the rat make a conscious decision of whether they, experience, they want to experience pain or not to get a reward so then we know, okay, they are, think they are thinking, they're using their brain to make this decision. And that's pain. Okay, so how do I study it? Um, in my lab and basically in the past few years. Um, so there's this thing called translational research. I'm, I'm saying translational pain research because you guys probably have been exposed to basic scientists, maybe talking about, I was just talking about animal research. Um, there are scientists that focus just on cells. There are scientists that just focused on molecules, okay? Um, so I'm, you know, and, and so if you're not familiar, there's this thing called the translational spectrum. Have, has anybody heard of that? So when we're talking about research, we can go from T for translation T0, T1, T2, and T3 to T4. T0 is usually very discovery. It's very much in the animal, um, very much molecule, very much mechanistic, straight through type of research. Then in T1, we're trying to move that into humans. And my days, my research these days is more there then you go to T2 where you translate what I find, for example, in healthy people, let me apply it to chronic pain patients, right? And then we say, let's apply it and look at the United States population in large epidemiological studies. So we just did uh, be a collaboration with University of Pittsburgh, a large chronic pain, the, the first one in aging, looking at um, 200 older adults and we imaged their brain and they've been coming for a long time now. Um, and this was basically like in Pittsburgh and in Memphis. And so that is more to T3, T4, like down. Are you guys doing that on, as a longitudinal study? So that particular study is a longitudinal study that has been going on for about 20 years. Yeah. And I was just via collaboration because I found out they had MR MRI at two different time points. Ooh, let me let me look and see if what I'm seeing in this T1 sort of I bring people to the lab and I test them and I put them in the scanner, the brain imaging, right, to look at their brain. Does that apply to people out in the community, right, in the middle of nowhere, and not just like a hundred people, but like three hundred people, or you know, there's there's other studies where. Like the UK has right now a huge one where they have imaged 15,000 people. So that is like awesome. 
So this is a disclaimer, and, and again, so you'll hear, I, I, I say I study pain mechanisms, okay? Um, mechanisms means a lot of different things depending who you talk to. So it actually is when we study multiple dynamic processes at different levels. So when I'm talking about, for example, the nervous system, I can be talking about the periphery, a nerve here, maybe in the way in spinal cord all the way up to the brain, okay? Uh, but a lot of the molecular people, if they're looking at one signaling cascade in one organelle, so let's say in the mitochondria, then their mechanism is that mitochondria in there, all the chemicals, how they're talking to each other and how you inhibit, like, so it's sort of very vast. But because I study humans, I am mostly here looking at the whole person and whole level, system level, okay? And so what I do, there are different ways that I can study this mechanism. So I can give people drugs <coughs> and see how they react. Um, I can give them, I give them pain in the lab. Um, that's a whole separate lecture, which is a lot of fun. Um, we measure a lot of circulating uh, biomarkers, we call them, but a lot of circulating molecules. Uh, we can also measure genetic markers. I haven't done as much um, really, actually my lab, I haven't done that <laughs> since really I've been here at UF. Um, and then what I'll talk to you a little bit about today is neuroimaging, where we're looking into the brain. Why? Because I told you, right? No brain, no pain. So I figured, and that's what can modulate everything else. So I figured I would focus my energies in the brain. And I just love the brain. If you know about it, you'll love it too. Just, just look at it. All right, so basically I'll tell you, we bring people to the lab and they're about an hour and a half in a MRI scanner, which is very tight and uncomfortable and um, they just do it because they're helping us for science and really they're nice and good natured and we pay them just a little bit to make it almost worth it. Um, but you know, once we get them in there, we are actually able in that about hour 15 time to get a number of different ways to look at the brain, okay? So there is what we call structural uh, MRIs where we actually are able to look at the structure and, and the brain can have white matter where it's basically a lot of the, um, the, the connections really because of the myelin between neurons. Neurons are the major nerve cells. Uh, there's also glia which are supporting cells for as an intro. Um, they're really important though so I don't want to make it sound like they're not because they're hugely important for functioning. Um, so when we look at the gray matter, mostly we're looking at cells. Um, white matter is connections. Um, then there's empty space, which is liquid, CSF, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, okay, that we'll have. And so, but then we can have like what we call functional MRI or imaging where we are actually looking at changes, either Resting, meaning I leave you there and your brain is doing something at rest, believe it or not, I'll talk to you about it in a second, or I'm gonna poke you, give you pain, and look at your brain and see what it does, or I'm gonna give you a hard cognitive task, which is basically like start subtracting sevens, you know, or this really sort of highly, thinking, higher thinking tasks. And I wanna see how your brain changes, okay? And then we have ways to look at the brain biochemistry, okay? So um, to tell you a little bit about, for example, cortical thickness, um, we, this is our original brain structure that we get. We take out the skull, okay? So a lot of this, it's really easy to get them into the MRI, get that data then the work begins. Like you, we sit there and we gotta go through different softwares, pre-process the images to be able to do all this that I'm telling you. Um, so we remove the skull, you get your brain by, there by itself. So to get cortical thickness, it basically either, it used to be that you had to draw it by hand per brain. <sighs> Just awful. But now we have this beautiful validated algorithms that 
uh, neural engineering uh, individuals have figured out and it works beautiful. So all I gotta do is pull it up in my huge screen in my office and check that basically it looks about right that this is, so this is my gray, um, my white matter, what I was telling you, which are basically connections. Then this are my cells and this is what I'm interested in, this particular modality. And you see here, you get this rim. So you just look at each brain and you do uh, QC, which is quality control, okay? We just check, oh, yeah. Um, and so, for example, in our um, sample, or so in our group of older adults that have knee osteoarthritis, okay, we did this, we looked at the cortical thickness and we found basically that in an area that's related to attention, executive function, their gray matter was decreased compared to those that didn't have the knee pain, basically. But then when we looked at the brain in the primary motor cortex, the region that's related to um, the leg and the knee, then that area was significantly increased. Now, I gotta warn you that we don't know exactly what the heck it means for this gray matter to be either increased or decreased, which is why I do, and I don't rely at all on this <laughs> solely, because we don't know if it means more cells, more neurons, more glia, um, you know, is it transient? Does it go away? Because we've seen some reversible changes after successful therapy, but we don't know. And this is kind of part of the fun in a way that we're trying to figure out, you know, what are these things that we can do to people and what do they mean on a biological basis that, you know, is it, is it worth changing? So just to, to give you that premise. Um, but for example, Another measure, which we do know more what it means, um, is this idea of connectivity. We have all these regions in the brain, we know they talk to each other, but they don't talk to each other in random patterns. They talk to each other in kind of very specific, so if you're doing a particular task, the relevant areas are gonna be recruited and they're gonna talk to each other, and that's what we talk about, high connectivity between those regions. So for example, if I put you in the scanner, which what I call at rest, um, at rest, and I say, look at this cross and don't think about anything in particular. Mind wandering. Hundreds of people basically have been asked to do this and we see the same exact thing. There is uh, an area called default mode. You're just chilling there, particularly not doing anything. These regions will talk to each other. Um, then, once you um, give them something to think about, higher critical thinking, they have, there's an, our executive network, which will light up. Basically, you'll see the connectivity between the areas increase. The same for visual stimuli, right? Something that you see or um, a task, either movement or sens uh, sensation related, um, attention or pain uh, or anything for example, violence or things that grabs your attention will wake up, I call it, the salience network, okay? So if you think about nodes in the brain of these regions, we know how much they talk to each other. So in the, um, this here are the seven regions that are associated with what I just told you, the default mode network. Think of default, right? Like you're chilling, not particularly thinking about anything in the scanner, these seven regions highly talking to each other. We know that that talk is normal and it's good. And people that have um, mental health issues, uh, other health issues have been shown to have problems, including chronic pain in this particular network, very weak. So um, for example, our research, we see that those with knee pain and trust me, these are all the, the seven regions I was telling you and how they talk to each other in blue, you see is higher than in red for the most part in the ones, the older adults that had knee pain. And that's because the, the older adults that have pain, they're, you know, it's a weaker connectivity in those regions. However, when we probe and there's this area, so the brain 
is closed right here. If I pull it out, there's this hidden area called the insula, which is part of the salience network. And you know, in the pain field, we think it's ours, so we say, you know, if you have pain, this is what you get. But really, if you have anything bad, like I show you a really ghastly thing or something that really shakes you to your core, the insula is going to light up. You know, but for pain, it's really important because you need to pay attention. It's a, what we call salience. So if it's anything negative, you will you will look up. In both. So this is this is this cross section on this is the side view. I open it and it's there. If I turn it around, I, w I actually thought about bringing my brains to show you, but um, then you also open the other side and you see it's just on both sides. So that region, when we look, guess who the default mode network is talking more to? That region, if you have pain. So, um, and the same thing, so if I poke people, the insula, you know, so actually this is without poking, sorry. This is increased at rest. Um, <coughs> their insula is higher, it's lit up. It's already, there's a lot more activity there already. Um, and if I poke them, in the scanner, their insula just lights up like significantly more than the controls. Finally, we can look at actual, like I was telling you, biochemistry of the brain. And so we, this is a brain, and we put a little voxel. Voxel, we can actually um, look at the whole brain as well, although I'm not doing that right now. But um, I just put a little area of interest. I said, okay, I want to look at the frontal cortex. I want to look at my somatosensory cortex. And then from there, I get a spectrum, basically, that the peak of the spectrum is corresponding to the concentration of those chemicals in that region. So, for example, what's really cool is that um, if you know, if you've taken neuroscience or anything like that, have you heard of GABA? So GABA is, a, is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the nervous system, which means we need inhibition all the time, as you saw with pain inhibition to decrease it. And the nervous system is full of inhibition because these neurons that release this chemical called GABA need to put a stop to all the other neurons basically to function, okay? Um, so we can measure that. We can also measure glial markers. We can measure a marker for uh, neuronal health. So then, like I was telling you, we don't know exactly what cortical thickness does. However, we know about this, and if we put it all together, it's like a puzzle that we're putting together to figure out what is going on. Because unless the person dies, we can't look in the brain. The nice thing about neuroimaging <laughs> is that we can look and get a you know, better understanding than in other circumstances, okay? It's not, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <clears throat> so that's the part about my research. Um, so let me tell you then about me. So I was born and raised in Cuba and um, that's Cuba, that's Florida, right? So I was born right there and I was raised. And um, <coughs> basically uh, as a teenager, when we had been wanting to leave, my father wanted to bring me to the US to me to have better opportunities and have a better life like all immigrants. So basically when as a teenager, we got on a raft and we came here and we barely made it to Key West um, alive. <laughs> Um, and then, so I had to learn English. Um, I, you know, was fortunate to have a, an advisor who helped me apply for scholarships. So I got into UF and I did a degree in microbiology and cell science.